Sure. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Faith Howard Mooney. I'm the VP of Member Engagement at TMC, and we are excited today um, to have one of our lender members in our industry and someone that I've just had the delight to meet in the last several weeks that we decided we may be buddies going forward. Um, so Keith Cantor, who is the CEO of First Community Mortgage, thanks for joining us and sharing information today. Thanks, Faith. We're happy to be on and uh, ready to get started. And Chrissy Waldron, who is in private practice um, as an organizational psychologist who specializes in leadership. So we are so lucky to have you join us um, today as well and share your insights on um, the topic of leadership programs. It's something that over the last year in our industry, um, people have had a lot of conversation about with the volume increase that we have. I think a lot of people felt like they had, um, not prepared for that from a leadership standpoint within their team. And um, people are talking about it now and thinking as things have slowed down a little bit about how can we not, um, how can we prepare for this um, going um, into kind of the next stage of things as they happen. Um, and just like, why, why is it so important? So I think I would love to just start there with Keith. I mean, obviously this is something that you did during this time period. So I'd love for you to share, you know, what your thought process is organizationally for why you're developing leaders um, and kind of what you're gonna get out of that investment in doing so. Sure thing, it's a, it's a great place to jump off is why FCM built a leadership academy in general. Um, you know, really, and I know there might be some fintech guys on the call, but, uh, you know, I believe people and our team members are the most important asset of an organization, even though some may say technology, but I disagree with that totally. But uh, our people are our greatest asset. And when we look at uh, our people, um, I think a lot of times we structure goals in our organization to center around development of people. And they may not all be written the same way, but and, and they may be tied up in our core values, but they're going to be something like helping our employees reach, us, reach the highest potential, or it might be developing best-in-class leadership. Or I looked around as I was prepping for this call, and I saw good to great on my shelf. And, and, and there's a whole chapter and section develop, you know, developing level five leadership uh, you know, that Jim Collins talks about in the book. So we know that the development of our people is very important. And when you dive into the mortgage industry, uh, a lot of people don't go to college to, uh, to, to join the mortgage industry. They kind of just fall into it in various ways. And even if we go to college or we don't go to college, uh, we're trained to do a skill and we might learn to be an accountant or a dentist or a mortgage banker. And we do that role very well. And, and, and we, we, you know, we have very talented and smart people within the industry working across this industry, helping people uh, achieve home ownership. And the next thing you know, they're rewarded for their talents by promotion. And the next thing you know, they're an underwriting manager or the director of compliance, or they're the, the dreaded producing branch manager sometimes. <laughs> uh, and they have no leadership experience whatsoever. And then on the flip side of that, or, or, or conversely, uh, the expertise tied up in either the C-suite or the executive leadership of a company, they're busy every day running the core functions that they have to do in the organization. So they can't stop and unplug and take the time needed to uh, develop those leaders the right way, or they might not have the expertise to even do that themselves. So ultimately that's the gap we find ourselves in. That was the gap at FCM. Um, and that's how we, uh, sought out Krisha to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And um, I would love to hear, I'm sure everybody would on the call. It's kind of a daunting thing when you think about it from the beginning and you've maybe never been down the path of implementing a program like this. Um, would love to hear a little bit about how your program is set up and, and why why it's set up that way for you, because there's obviously not just one way 
um, to do things. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about your specific leadership program. Sure, we, we had back and forth with Krisha many sessions about do we do it internally, do we do it externally, because there's a lot of great universities, a lot of great private practices that, that develop, that have leadership programs. And we landed on the internal approach, I think, because we could develop our own core competencies that we, that were most important to us. So these aren't exactly it, but these are six kind of core competencies that I think that were important to us. And ours were a little variants of this, but this is, I, I just did high level for this call, but we looked at leadership style. We looked at values-based leadership. We look at coaching skills, conflict resolution, team dynamics, and an enterprise mindset and um, developing an enterprise mindset. So those were what was important to us. And I think that's the, the, the biggest um, advantage to developing a, a leadership academy or a leadership program within your organization that you own, that you control and you develop the curriculum is you can customize it to whatever fits your core values. What's important for your leadership to look like and your leadership to, to execute. And then just kind of get into the logistics, the nuts and bolts. And, and then I, I know Christian probably has some comments on this, but we had we, we did a nomination process. And uh, across FCM, we had 53 nominees uh, come in. And then those nominees would submit a pretty thorough application of why they would like to be selected. So we tried to make it very exclusive. Um, and uh, they did this application. And then that went to an application committee. And that committee selected the class that is now about 80% done with our first annual or inaugural class of, of FCMLA. So that's kind of how we got from, that's a snippet of how we got from point A to point B. And can you share with us kind of how that's implemented within your team? Um, Cause I don't think if I remember right, you don't have, it's not an annual thing for you. You've made it a very specific time frame, and then also share what your participants in that leadership program, what their obligation or commitment is. So we're gonna, we are gonna be running the program every year from January to I guess June uh, or, or is when the classes are taking place and we go once a month. And I believe, Chris, you correct me if I'm not mistaken, but it's like four hours, five hours. We run from like 12 to four or five. And uh, the, the commitment is, uh, is really, no, uh, can't miss any sessions. And uh, obviously, if something comes up that's, you know, emergency, they certainly can make up. But, um, you know, at the, we, we expect a high adherence to attendance, to participation. There's homework given. There's, there's projects that are done. And then at the end, uh, you know, we have a graduation ceremony, certificates awarded. You know, it's a big deal. And I think Krisha could maybe speak a little bit more on this is, um, this is master's type work. Um, we have some of the finest instructors across the country coming in and doing master's type leadership work. So, you know, maybe Krisha could talk on that. Yep. Yeah, We'd love to have that happen, but before we go down that path, Krisha, just for everybody that's on the call, please um, drop, we can unmute you if you want to ask a question or drop your uh, questions in the Q&A or chat for us. And we will get those addressed with either Krisha or, or with um, Keith. And um, yeah, if you could just kind of share with us a little bit about the type of program and what maybe some of the options would be available for people when they're looking at developing um, an internal or an external program. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think um, part, of, part of sharing thoughts about this um, makes the most sense if I add that my start in this field was in a purely academic setting. I thought I wanted to be a faculty member and work in university settings and in um, graduate level business schools teaching leadership to business students. And then early on in my career, I got the really fortunate experience of working with leaders at work doing on the ground leadership and development of their people. And I mean, there wasn't any comparison anymore because you all are out in the world of 
making people go and keeping them happy and understanding what they need to do their work uh, in the best way they're capable of. And most importantly, building organizations that thrive and that really nurture people's sense of potential and, um, and everything that they're capable of. So the long story short of that is that because my start was in an academic environment, now that I do work for um, individual clients and for private companies and you know some very large nonprofits and some public companies, what I've been able to do is to see how university-based programs are easily implementable in private companies or organizations of all different sizes. Um, and so what Keith sort of gave me the chance to do with him was to create a program that really had the qualities of the kind of experience a leader would have if they were sent to a very well-known university um, external program in the environment of his company. And so one of the pieces I was thinking about earlier is that doing a program internally gives you a chance to really capitalize on the cultural implications of an experience like this one. So, you know, First Community Mortgage branded this program with just a beautiful design. So we're very cohesive. The experience that the participants are having isn't just sort of increasing their awareness of leadership concepts and the content, but and giving them a chance to reflect on it and experience it and all that good stuff we think about when we think about education. But it's also deeply connecting them to their organization and it's creating relationships between the participants in the sessions. So, you know, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but one of the, you can probably tell, I have, a, I love university programs. I still teach in them, but my bias is that when you have an opportunity to create something for yourself, doing so gives your people a chance to learn with each other in an environment that continues to build and nurture the culture that you want to strengthen in your organization. So you not only get the content you really want, but you get this sort of lift of the experience everyone's having together and that they build on over time. For sure. We did have a question that came in kind of related to that in the college experience. It's what is it that colleges can do to prepare students or new people into that would be coming into our organization in the area of leadership in a workplace? Uh, well, you know, Keith said it really well when you were describing Keith, the way in which we come into our professions with some amount, sometimes not a whole lot, but we come in with some amount of technical knowledge and not a lot of leadership skills. So I've been teaching for, well, it's been 15 years now in a medical school. So physicians who are now leaders, they know their medical craft beautifully, but they haven't learned leadership. So what colleges can do, I think some of what colleges are doing it's been always available for students, and that is to give students an opportunity to participate in on-campus organizations and leadership experiences. And it's that experience of being responsible for something, even at a young age, and carrying it through that really gives everyone a taste of how hard it is. And I'm thinking right now about teaching the required leadership course to undergraduate business students. Um, who most, most of those folks are, I don't know, right? Like 19, 20, 21, even the MBAs are really young. And they typically, if they haven't had an actual experience of leadership, they think it's just self-evident and easy. You know, so like someone like me will teach motivation and it sounds so intuitive. It sounds so obvious that um, if you're a really bright student and you're ambitious, you think I can do that. But you all uh, with us right now know that when you try to motivate people who are disengaged or you try to address conflict in you know, some kind of sensitive relationship, it is so much harder to actually do it than it sounds like it would be when you read a leadership article or you hear someone talk about having a courageous conversation. It's just in the practice a much more challenging endeavor than um, people realize when they haven't felt it themselves. So the one thing I would say is any experience that gives students, all of us, felt experiences of leading others is the best preparation for leadership in the workplace. 
Can you talk some about the pros of uh, developing your own internal program um, related to culture and those other kinds of things? Are there some, I mean, are there pros and cons of, um, you know, kind of going one way or another that as people develop their program, they maybe should be cognizant of? Yeah, I would love Keith's thoughts about this. I haven't asked him, but I'm, so I'm dying to know. <laughs> My thought about the con is primarily, so people often assume it's a cost that, the, that developing something internally is really expensive. Um, knowing a little bit about external programs and what they cost, <laughs> it's actually not that much more, if at all more expensive to develop something internally. The, the investment of financial resources ends up sort of being around how many people you want to put through a leadership program. So if you really, if you're an organization that wants to send three people a year, well then obviously you're gonna do better to send those three people to a well-selected external program. Um, but I think Keith, the program we're running for our first community is 20-ish, 25. I should know this off the top of my head, something like that. And at that number, um, doing something that you then own and can replicate yourself as an organization over time is far more cost-effective. But in terms of a con, I would say, first of all, that to make it cost-effective, you need a class of leaders. So you've sort of got to make it big enough and give them the time and the space to participate in a program. So as we talked about, this one involves it's six, it's officially six long half days. So I think it's a, I think it is a five and a half hour uh, session, six times a year. And then there are some additional experiences that they're having on their kind of their own, they're scheduling themselves. Um, but the real sort of the con that, um, I mean, to me, of course, I'm biased, it's not a con. It requires the involvement of your senior leadership. Because if you hire someone, you know, even if they're a really skilled practitioner, to come in and put together an internal program, but you as a senior leader are not involved in that program. I mean, you just don't get the full lift of what happens when you're an involved, maybe not a participant, Keith doesn't attend most of the sessions, but to have been involved in speaking into the design, talking about, you know, and really thinking and reflecting on what's most important in your organization. You know, so if you want just an off the shelf, you know, five great skills for leaders, then it may not be worth your time and investment to create something that's particular to your organization. But Keith, I would love to know, do you, can you think of a con to doing it internally? Well, you hit on it. It was, it, it, it was really, especially last year with, with the industry, the way it was in the business levels, it was the amount of time it, it didn't take, a, we got it done, <laughs> but the time it takes to to, to get it off the ground mm -hmm. and to, like you say, um, uh, I, I think Dan participates in, we have a, what, what's interesting is it was a great idea by our president, Dan, uh, Dan Smith, in the afternoon is when the sessions take place, but our instructor is kind of already lined up for the day. So mm -hmm. we use the morning to bring the senior executive team leaders in and they do kind of a scaled down version of what the participants are gonna learn in the afternoon. So I know Dan participates in that. And um, I, I just think it's the time, like you say, and, and really also, and this isn't a con, but you, know, you can't put an algorithm or a slide rule to this and say, this is what your return on investment's gonna be when you invest this. These are people. And uh, as Christian and I've talked about often, people are messy. And it takes time and it takes effort, and um, but it's worth it because um, not only are you going to develop, we talked a little bit about this before the call, but, but not only are you going to develop great leaders in your organization to make your organization more efficient, uh, have better results, all the things that maybe benefit the shareholders, but then think about, as Krisha has hit on, the cultural implications and the, the diversity that takes place in the group and the relationships that are formed, the engagement, the retention, these people in this class will leave this class for years and have bonds that, that, that are connected in this class that it otherwise wouldn't be there. So there's all kinds of benefits beyond the financial, the efficiency, the things like that. And I know we're speaking on cons, but 
really, I think the only one of, of setting it up internally is the time it takes to, to do it. Are there other things, Keith, that you've come across now that you've been into it for a little while and you're rolling through your first class that, that you need to do to ensure success within the program that maybe weren't really clear when you started, but have become clear as you've moved along? Yeah, I, it's certainly, um, I, 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 we don't have the answers for this. So I'll, 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 I'll throw out a few things that have come up and then, then Christian might have a couple as well, but we've already had leaders in the class say, okay, can we continue this <laughs> type yeah. of coaching? And, and what's the resources maybe that you're gonna put forward to help us continue on this path? That's been a question that's been posed that um, we don't have an answer for yet. Um, also, you know, and, and I think Krisha could speak on this, how do we, how do we keep them engaged and accountable to the things that they learn so that they, number one, keep it in practice, and number two, don't just do what time sometimes happens, and that is, of course, you learn something, you put it on the shelf, and then you don't implement it. I think that's, that's the key to success on how we keep this kind of fresh and, and, and going um, um, af after they graduate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, one of the things, you know, that we thought about um, when considering this topic as a whole for a conversation like this one is sort of what are some of the mistakes that people can make when they're just starting out and doing something like this for the first time? And I think one of the mistakes is not thinking about what you're going to do with your alumni, <laughs> because if it works, they get really excited about their leadership growth. They get really motivated and engaged in meeting the needs of their teams and their people. And um, so what you don't want to do is get them all super excited and then just donk, you know, like <laughs> it just ends in a kind of a, um, in a sad sort of way. So one of the ways you can keep alumni involved, I mean, there are simple kinds of things. You don't have to do something really complicated, but there can be one of the organizations I did this work for recently has alumni sessions that are only available to people who went through the original program. So, and they might be highly specialized topics. You know, we did one recently. This, thankfully these days, it's not that specialized, but at the time, how implicit bias was affecting decision-making was a hour and a half long session and lunch was provided. And, um, and again, it was only open to people who had gone through the program. So there's a little feeling of um, exclusivity as we were talking about earlier, which is really selectivity. Because overall, when you're thinking about a program like this, the more inclusive you can be at multiple levels of your organization, multiple different roles and, um, and backgrounds and different kind of ac even academic experiences make for a rich, rich class of people. So, but I think one of the mistakes is not thinking about how you're going to keep that lift and keep people engaged. So you can do that through, you know, having workshops every now and again that are available to them. But you can also do it in a very simple way through one of the features of this program, which is that part of what they've done, you know, one of the, now I'll get a little bit on the soapbox about leadership education, but um, because leadership is so much harder when you do it than when you just listen to it or listen to people talk about it, uh, the more experiential the learning can be, the more effective it will be for everyone. So one of the experiential opportunities we gave this class was the opportunity to practice coaching skills with one another. So those relationships we expect and we will encourage to continue past the six month program. They all won't, but a lot will. And when we look back at programs over time, we find that those kind of early forced interactions lead to long-term reflection about the kinds of things they learned in the program that come up later in their work experiences or to the kinds of things that come up later in work experience or in promotion opportunities that they didn't really think about or didn't understand when they were in the program originally, but now they've gotten curious about it and they have people to connect with and to talk to long-term. So um, those would be a couple of easy ways you can keep people engaged and developing and feeling like um, they can capitalize on that momentum. This is a little, because it doesn't, this 
this topic is a little off because it doesn't tie directly with the FCMLA, but it ties to this question. Um, we're looking to start this fall, and, and we wanted to do it opposite side of the year than the FCMLA because we don't want there to be any confusion. But we want to start a mentorship program where we have mentors and mentees within the organization, especially for young professionals that are coming in and just want to learn a, a wide variety of things about business and, and life and such. But the first group I'm going to go to to ask to be mentors will be uh, this class and ask them to serve. So it's kind of that selectivity that Krisha was talking about that we can go back to alumni of this, this class to draw them into wherever we can fit them in the organization to continue to develop leadership uh, abilities and, and, and acumen. And one of the things that you said, um, Krisha, that was just very interesting to me is how do you develop that rich group of people that maybe bring their differences to the table. Um, in my past experience, I'm sure other people have had the same thing. A lot of times people selectively choose um, individuals that are maybe at a certain level in their organization to go through leadership training, which doesn't sound, I don't think that's what you've done here. So I'd love to hear um, from either one of you about kind of how you chose the people or what was your goal in choosing the people that would participate um, in your initial group. Would it work, Keith, for me to share what I asked you all to do and then you can say what you actually did, which is, I think, <laughs> pretty similar. Sure, sure. <laughs> so, we, follow, um, we do whatever Krisha says. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds so, like she's um, on a good path. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, I, of course, think about, when I think about putting together a great group of leaders to be in a program like this one, I think about two things. I think first about what will, how to put together a group of people that will create a natural, organic, engaged experience for one another in class, in the time that they're, they're gonna to be together a whole bunch, you know, over the six month period of time. So how do you put, how do you think about putting people together where there is enough difference that they can learn a lot from one another and learn about different parts of the organization, but where there's enough points of connection that they can create those relationships without it feeling, you know, kind of overwhelming or, um, or just too much of a stretch. So there's that piece. And then the second piece relates to one of the points we talked about earlier, which is that one of the great opportunities of doing a program in your organization is that you have this unbelievable ability to impact your culture and to really support it and nurture it and strengthen it. So I also think about who are the people who once they've gone through an experience like this one can go back out into the organization and positively impact uh, others who didn't get a chance to participate yet, but, um, but who might get some of that same energy and enthusiasm just through being in connection with the people who got a chance to participate. Um, so on that note, I, and okay, and then there's one more piece, another layer on top of this is that when you start a program like this one, it is really important to involve your more senior leaders early because you, know, you can just imagine if you have a faculty member coming in and they're saying, you know, eat peanut butter for breakfast and you'll have energy all day, but your boss is saying, you know, skip breakfast and you'll have most energy all day. You want there to be a lot of consistency and cohesion between the kinds of things they're learning from outside faculty members and what they're experiencing in their own work environments and with their own leaders and managers. So, um, so in the early years, especially in the first year, but certainly in the first couple of years, if you're gonna do an annual program, you might have more senior leaders than you will longer term because you've got to get some of those people who are highly influential through the program to experience it themselves and to come to terms with whether there are some pieces of advice that need to get worked out organizationally or in your industry specific to your context so that there aren't these places of contradiction or confusion out into the world and out into the, um, into the organization. So, that's why, um, as Keith mentioned in this program, we have a morning session that is really just for the executive team to be exposed to and to work through some of that material we're gonna be sharing with the full class that afternoon. And that was a way to heavy kind of 
you know, front load the senior leadership in the educational experience. Um, but in general, what I asked um, Keith and the selection committee to do is to think about who's ready and sort of, maybe they didn't self-select that they were ready. So they were nominated by someone who could see potential in them, but they're, they already have a bit of an appetite for learning and growth and enough ambition around their career and around their work that they're gonna put in the extra time and a little bit extra energy it takes to participate in something like this. Um, and to be honest, students. So when something sounds too good to be true in a class that they're willing to say, well, yeah, that sounds great, but in my team, this is how that might go. And then, you know, the faculty and the students can work out, yeah, how do we make that real? How do we make that make sense for you and your team and the kinds of people that you're leading? So um, ability to challenge and enough confidence to be able to speak their minds are qualities as well. Um, but we talked about bringing in people at multiple levels. And so there might be somebody in the class who doesn't have a direct managerial responsibility, but they would be in that case, a person who leadership can see has the capacity to have managerial responsibility at some point in the near future. And I think Keith, y'all did that beautifully. I mean, the class, but they're actually in session right now. Did you realize that Keith? I bet you did. Yeah. They're in session right now. Right. And they're such an incredible group. Um, the, con the, the topic today is conflict. So they're right in the midst of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think naturally by taking that advice that Krisha gave us and then just looking across the organization, we run, you know, kind of multiple uh, channels at FCM, retail, wholesale, correspondent, have a servicing division, and then of course, corporate support. We made sure that we tried to pull people out from each of those different divisions and areas of the organization. And um, it created just a natural uh, diversified group that was really healthy. And uh, as Krisha as said, uh, we're really excited about. Fantastic. Again, just a quick reminder um, to our audience today, please ask questions, raise your hand or put things in the Q&A. We're kind of coming up toward the end of the session. Um, so we'd love to get any questions that you have for either Keith or Krisha answered um, before we go today. Um, one of the things that we had kind of um, talked about a little bit when we first got together and chatted were, um, can you share like some of the core competencies that you looked for in your selection process for leaders developing and whether those were just um, general things that people could be looking for or things that were specific to your organization and kind of what your strategy was? I'll let Krisha do that. <laughs> Good. I um I have a I have a strong inclination towards starting. So I, in addition to working with um, leaders in educational settings like the one we're talking about, uh, I do a great deal of work with um, with individual leaders in coaching on the sofa right behind me. I don't know how well you can see my screen, but I'm here in my office and. Um, and I have folks coming in, uh, certainly these days we're kind of starting to get back to normal, but I work with founders and CEOs, senior leaders and executive teams. And once in a while I get a chance to work with a high potential person um, within their kind of leadership world. And sometimes we're solving a complicated problem and we know what that is at the outset. And sometimes we're just working on that person's general skill level or comfort or um, sometimes it's just their experience of what work is like. So it's those individual experiences with leaders that drives the way I think about content and the creation of an incredible leadership program. And so because of that, it really starts with the individual. So Keith's program is organized around three basic levels of analysis. And the first one's the individual level. So we did two days, one day on understanding the self and did a really deep um, and intense uh, assessment of leadership style. It's one of my favorites, it's called the Berkman, if anyone happens to have experience with it. 
Uh, there are several you could choose from that are really good. So we did sort of some self analysis to get individual leaders starting to get reflective around who they are and what they bring to the task of leadership and the role and how they take that up. And then we subsequently moved through, um, then we're starting to look at leading others and sort of how those our values shape how we lead other people. Then we move into interpersonal dynamics, kind of one-on-one. -on -one. That's where we did coaching skills. And today they're working on conflict and communication skills. Uh, and then we're gonna move into the more group level uh, team dynamics and then ending with enterprise mindset. So enterprise mindset is such a, you know, like mouthful that really just describes giving people at multiple levels of an organization. So whether they're kind of high potential or just maybe have one direct report all the way through a senior leader, to help them develop their ability to think about the organization as a whole. Um, because most of us, we can't help it. We think about our work and we think about decisions and we have opinions and we have beliefs that are really based on our individual perspective. And so the more, especially in a learning environment and a growth oriented learning environment, we can help people stretch their capacity to take other perspectives, to take the perspective of another department, to take the perspective of someone who might sit across from them in a structural conflict of some kind. Um, so you can kind of think about the classic like risk and um, risk and sales functions of an organization, the way that there is this natural tension that exists between those two areas. So when we get up to the enterprise mindset, they have learned so many foundational skills and they've learned so much about themselves that they're ready to really take the perspective of other people. And if we can sort of give people a chance to know who they are really well, and start to understand how they reach other people more skillfully and then leave them with a sense of an organizational level of competence, you've got a really well-rounded leader. Um, so that basic stair step is my preference because I know how, how starting with the self leads us to be in a better position to understand other people. And um, Keith, we did have uh, a question come into the chat. Well, really more of us, something that they wanted you to comment on. It says, I miss the core competencies that Keith shared in the beginning, leadership style, core value. Um, can he repeat those for us? Sure, and, and those, uh, those core competencies were really the basis of the, the program topics or our agenda that Krista just went over. So our first was mm -hmm. leadership style and, um, Again, that, that's really looking at the um, self. And so it was leadership style, values-based leadership, um, coaching skills, conflict resolution, uh, team dynamics, and then enterprise mindset. Those were the core competencies. Mm -hmm. And you know, that kind of reminds me, we haven't talked about it specifically, but um, it might be interesting for people to think about this aspect of the program as well, because whether you're ready to do something like this or not quite ready to do something at the scale, you could do this piece I'm gonna share, which is that as a part of this program, we created a customized 360 tool for FCM. So lots of you probably use different 360 tools to give your leaders, to give everyone an ability to get good feedback. Um, but because we had this opportunity to get really customized for this group of leaders, we decided, and I do this with lots of clients I work with because I'm, as everyone is in their specialty field, I get real picky about the assessments I like to use. So um, there are a lot of good 360 assessments, but most of them are drawing from very generalized thoughts about leadership. And as anyone knows who's been in multiple roles or different kinds of organizations, the kind of skill or characteristic or trait that works in one circumstance doesn't work necessarily in another. So if I need to know how how I'm performing at First Community Mortgage, I need to know how I'm performing on the dimensions that are most important here, not the dimensions that are most important like to the you know, authors of the books on the bookshelf behind me. So 
we developed a customized 360 based on the leadership competencies that we learned were most important at First Community Mortgage. Um, and so those competencies, can I share those, Keith? Is that okay sure. for me to throw these out there? Yeah. Those yeah. competencies were um, that leaders should be agile, enterprising, forthright, motivating, and proactive. Um, and we, of course, had definitions for each of those. But when the leaders who went through this program took a 360 and invited their colleagues to participate in giving them field feedback, confidential, real feedback, it was on these dimensions that we asked about, not generic ones. So there are a couple of ways to think about competencies in the program that Keith has built. And one is, are the topic areas, which we've just talked about, but the other would be these particular leadership competencies that we're encouraging all of the participants to really think about and make their own. Perfect, perfect. Um, and so we, right now we're kind of at the end of our time. It goes by so fast, I can't believe it. Um, do not have any additional questions out there. Um, for you at this point in time. So if you have one, drop it in there really quickly for us. I think um, there was one that dropped in, maybe. Uh, it says uh, I missed the last one, sorry. Okay, so- Krista, that, could you do those again? Yeah, so the leadership competencies that we used to build the 360 were, in your case, Keith, for your organization, agile, enterprising, forthright, motivating, and proactive. Thank you. Missed that one out there. Appreciate that. Um, you obviously have developed a, just a super uh, program. Can't believe after we've talked about this that you got all of this accomplished in the crazy year that we had last year and have it rolled out. So kudos to you. Um, really appreciate both of you sharing such great information within the network and maybe more importantly, just sharing your time with us. I know how valuable it is to both of you. Um, and if we have any additional comments come in, we'll reach out um, and let you know about those if you can answer them. But other than that, just really, really appreciate your time and would love to hear any last thoughts that you have today. I'll let you go first. Well, one of the questions, Faith, you'd asked us to kind of think about for this call was, you know, that question that we've alluded to earlier, what are the common mistakes or kind of like, what are the big mistakes people might make? And there are, I mean, I, I sort of think there's so many ways to do this, which is what's exciting. And the only mistake I can really think of is to not invest in leadership development in some very clear way not just to say the words, which we all say, because we do mean them. Like, you know, the people I work with are earnest, they're sincere, they really do care about increasing the leadership competence of their people. Um, but to actually do something, to make that manifest, to, to put some kind of actions or experiences behind a desire to develop people, because um, they're really worth it. And your organization is worth it. And you'll feel the difference once you've done it. Yeah, I would, I would just close faith with saying that the TMC organization, uh, yourself, Rich, just so many that, that lead the organization have done really, uh, you know, you guys, have, you guys have done these calls during COVID and the conferences that we can't wait to get back to. You guys have done so much for the mortgage community and in general. We're just appreciative to be able to give back something. So really blessed to be on the call today. Thank you, Keith. That's probably one of the kindest things that I've heard um, because we do like to invest um, in the lender members and the people that, that we reach out to every single day. So thank you for that. We really do appreciate that. And with that, I think we can end again. Appreciate both of you participating. It's been a joy talking with you. I'm sure people came away with this with notepads of notes on the things that they're going to take away and do, which is what TMC Connect is all about. So have a great rest of your day. If there's anything I can do for either one of you, please reach out and let me know. We'd love to do that. Thanks, Faye. Thank you all. Bye, Krisha. Bye-bye.